I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. The Peloponnesian Wars. The Peloponnesian Wars we learn from classic history uh, extend from 431 BC E to perhaps 404. There are two versions here: the war between Athens and Sparta, the war between Athens Empire and the Spartan Alliance. However, it is also the centerpiece of imagination for the last 2,500 years by every civilization that's come across uh, an historian by the name of Thucydides. To help us with understanding why the Peloponnesian Wars are as modern as the 21st century and the fragmenting of the planet right now into competing city-states and competing empires, J.E. Lendon, John Lendon, who uh, has written The Song of Wrath, The Peloponnesian War Begins, he is an historian at the University of Virginia. He's also uh, completely irresponsible to have spent so much time with this book and not with his family. John, congratulations and good evening. And I hope your family now embraces you again because you have spent years in the 5th century BCE telling us a story that is magnificent, has captivated civilizations for 2,500 years. And we need to go to the language, of course, because this is Greek, classic Greek, and two words that explain a deal of this feud, Time and hubris. What do they mean, John? Good evening. Time, good evening. Thank you very much for having me. Time is the uh, particular Greek quality of honor or relative rank that um, Homeric heroes and all subsequent Greek hero, uh, Greeks, but also Greek nations and city-states have. Uh, they all regard each other as basically ranked against each other, um, sort of like a football ranking or a baseball ranking. You want to be on the top, you don't want to be on the bottom. And your position in that system is your Time. Um, your hubris, well, hubris is an attack on your teammate. Uh, of course, we know the term from one of its extended English sentence, senses, which is uh, when you behave uh, in a fashion offensive to the gods, um, uh, a terrible fate uh, awaits you. But that, of course, is because you have insulted the gods, you have attacked their teammate. Uh, when you attack the teammate of another person or another state, that is an act of hubris and is likely to bring a terrible revenge, whether it is from the gods or from the other people. Now, the lucid and magnificent translation of this story from Time and Hubris takes place not on the basis of the historical record of the Peloponnesian Wars, but on the basis of everyone's understanding of Homer and the Iliad and how the heroes and the gods treated each other in that saga, and especially the relationship of Agamemnon, the king, leading the assault against Troy, and our hero, Achilles. How does that explain Time and Hubris, John? Well, Agamemnon thinks that he has the highest Time. And Achilles thinks that he is the highest Time. Time gives you the right to give orders. And Agamemnon tries to give Achilles orders. Achilles says, no, um, you don't have higher Time than me, therefore you're insulting me. Uh, Achilles then tr uh, tries to kill Agamemnon because of the insult, fails to do that, and then withdraws from the war. Uh, this is where wrath comes into the picture. Uh, the wrath of Achilles is what this is all about, and he is wrathful because his teammate has been subjected to hubris by Agamemnon. Uh, and similarly, Greek states become wrathful, when, like Sparta in this case, in the Peloponnesian War, when their teammate is subjected to hubris by people they consider to be their inferiors, like Athens. Now, John, what you've done is you've, uh, you've constructed the Greeks so I like them all over again, because what we're talking about is an entire civilization, the capstone of the world, one we still admire, the Parthenon built by it, the stories of Helen and Troy and all of that, all the whole civilization— derives its good conduct on the basis of make-believe, on the basis of the Iliad. Well, they didn't know, of course, it was make-believe. Uh, to, to them, the Iliad was both uh, was, uh, was uh, a, a fundamental text in a sort of way like the Bible, but was also history for them. Uh, so, yes, they thought this was their, um, they thought that this was their own ancient history, but that those, the people in the Iliad had been incredibly admirable, and therefore you should behave like them. And therefore, the states, the city-states, all understood that the relationship of Time and Hubris was fundamental to their daily commerce and to their war-making. And now we'll, now we'll bring this down to the city-states of the 5th century BCE. Athens 
in uh, a uh, state that derives much of its power from its navy, from its ability to at the sea, and Sparta, which is a land-based and a land army. Uh, rank them in terms of Time as we meet them in the 5th century BCE. Well, Sparta has been the leader of Greece in Time since the middle of the, uh, of the previous century. Uh, it, it, by conquering or, and by, by defeating its traditional uh, rival Argos, uh, Sparta becomes uh, the hegemon, from, from which, of course, we get the English word hegemony, uh, has, becomes the hegemon of Greece, uh, and basically everyone is expected to defer to the Spartans and do as they say. But then in the 5th century, when a- Athens accumulates a maritime empire, becomes extremely rich and powerful, uh, her belief, Athens' belief in her own team, may rises. She wants to be regarded as the equal of Sparta. The Spartans say no. We are the traditional leaders, the, the hegemons of Greece. We want to remain, retain that position. And if you claim to be equal to us, you are insulting us because you're claiming to be uh, our equal uh, in Time. And that's what insult and hubris is. Uh, and this is why eventually, as Athens pushes and pushes and pushes this insistence that they're equal in Time or sometimes even higher in Time uh, than the Spartans, the Spartans have no choice but to go to war. And uh, always, everybody has a sense of Time. Is it written down? Do they talk about it on a daily basis? One of the ways that was became romantic is that I think Sparta had the best women, another place has the best wine, another base, uh, place is the best singer. Is this popular legend that comes to us, or did they all know the rules? Um, no, they all know the rules. They talk about it all the time. They spend their lives talking about which individual has the most TMA, which state has the most TMA, ranking people against each other, uh, just as we would, for example, in, 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 in a uh, rotisserie baseball league right, or something right. of the sort. Right. So they carried it around with them. Their slaves knew it. Their, uh, their rivals knew it. Their enemies knew it. Could you move up in rank? Is that what war fighting is about? Could commerce move you up in rank? Commerce cannot move you up in rank, really. Uh, wealth can, but, uh, you, but the best way of getting wealth is by either tribute or taking it from defeated enemies. Um, they are uh, aristocratic, both the Spartans and the Athenians. Indeed, all the Greeks are rather aristocratic in their views of trade, um, which is not, it's not an honorable activity. You may do it, but you're not particularly proud of it. Uh, but the major way in which you rise in Time is exactly through warfare, uh, by defeating enemies in battle, by ravaging their fields. You push them down and push yourself up. So it's an incredibly dynamic system. At the same time, not everyone agrees on where they stand. I mean, this is the problem problem between Athens and Sparta, which is that it, the system exists in everybody's mind, but there's a lot of disagreement. The Athenians genuinely believe they're at their Sparta's equal. The Spartans genuinely believe the Athenians are not. One detail about uh, the two states, the rivalries. When the great king, the Persian king, challenged and invaded and was about to overrun all of Greece, it was the 300, the Spartans, who, who, uh, who met him and are celebrated afterwards. Did that, um, uh, did that in, uh, it contribute to, to Sparta's Time, and did that make Sparta untouchable from uh, everyone else's opinion? Uh, in large part, yes. Uh, Sparta, of course, leads the Greeks against the Persians. Its soldiers die heroically at the Battle of Thermopylae, and then it leads the Greeks to victory at the Battle of Plataea. Uh, uh, and um, that, is, that is a major claim, uh, Sparta's a major Spartan claim to uh, supremacy in, in Time. Although certainly the Spartans believe that having defeated the other major rival state to them before that, which is, a, again, Argos, they had established uh, pre- predem- preeminence in Time beforehand. Right. But this certainly proves it to the rest of Greece. They lead re- the rest of Greece, and their men die heroically in combat. That is how you demonstrate your Time. It's how we still remember them. One final detail before we get into the war itself. When someone is offended by uh, your misunderstanding or presumption, your hubris, what is the response? What is the necessary response to maintain your honor? Your necessary response is revenge. Uh, and this can be, if, if it's just talk, uh, then you can respond in talk. But, uh, if, but eventually, and in fact quite quickly, you get to a situation in which they're, um, uh, they're baiting you, their hubris is intolerable, and then you must go to war to demonstrate that you are in fact superior to them. Uh, victory in war ultimately sets 
the rankings of, of Team A. And therefore, if they challenge you and say we're equal, you say, no, you're not. We're going to defeat you in war and prove that we are better than you. If this sounds like a Greek play, you're right. It is <laughs> because the playwrights derived their understanding of a uh, fair and foul and hero and devil, all from this understanding of Time and hubris. I'm speaking with Professor J. E. Lendon, uh, John Lendon, whose book Song of Wrath: The Peloponnesian War begins, and we will next turn to the personalities who are called upon to apply Time and hubris, the politicians who lead Athens especially, but also Sparta, through this long period of strife that we now remember as the Peloponnesian Wars. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm continuing my conversation with John Lendon, whose magnificent book, overwhelmingly detailed about these battles. We have this information from Thucydides and some other sources, including Plutarch. However, putting, these, uh, putting their details down doesn't explain them. You have to explain them in terms of Time and hubris. Uh, John, let's go with the personalities that we know were dominant in Athens at this time from the first Peloponnesian Wars, which is mid-century, and then the second one where we focus on the 431 to 421 strife. Who is Simon, and what do we na- Simon, and what do we need to know about him? Uh, Cimon uh, is a leading Athenian politician. Uh, the thing about Athenian politicians is they tend to have themes, because they are, of course, uh, seeking team A like everybody else. They need to get votes, and one of the ways you get votes is by having a theme. Uh, Cimon's theme particularly is generosity. Uh, he's an enormously rich guy who gives away a huge amount of stuff. The story is he has some young men who follow him around on the street, and when he sees a poor person, he says to one of the young men, go change your cloak with that guy. Um, he lets people uh, take food from his fields. He has a, basically an open house every night at his villa. Anyone who wants to come to dinner can come to dinner. Um, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it to us sounds rather like Chicago politics, but um, this, is, this was regarded as a... Uh, as and perfectly normal activity in Athens, uh, Athenian democratic politics. Uh, and his particular, his political position that we know about most clearly is that he's very much in favor of uh, Athens and Sparta getting along, but on the basis of equality. He is, uh, and uh, John provides a glossary, so there are a lot of details about these important personalities. He's the son of you write of a victor of, Mar- of the Mar- Battle of Marathon. Does that give him extra time? Oh, enormously, uh, but uh, it's not least because that family, uh, the family of, of Miltiades, who's the, uh, the victor at uh, the Battle of Marathon, also claims to be descended from various Greek heroes uh, in, uh, in extreme antiquity, various Homeric heroes. But certainly Miltiades is the major figure of his generation. He leads the uh, Athenians to victory in an enormously important battle. Before that, he's, among other things, a, um, uh, a, uh, he, he owns an enormous amount of land up in, in the north of Greece, and he's a sort of servant of the great king. Uh, he's, uh, that is to say, the great king of Persia. Uh, he's a wonderfully charismatic and flexible figure, a tremendous hero uh, to the Greeks of his time, and certainly, therefore, he's a man of great time, and Cimon inherits a great deal of time from him. What is significant about him is that he's understood as pro-Sparta, and that's a problem. That's a problem to the Athenians when the Athenians and the Spartans fall out uh, over an insult that the Athenians feel that the Spartans have paid them. Uh, and then they send poor old Cimon into exile, and they choose other leaders who are much more anti-Sparta. And now we come to Pericles, who is a younger man. Uh, uh, Cimon lives between 510 uh, in the glossary to 450. He dies in battle against the Persians, so he, he maintains his teammate. But Pericles is a man who is anti-Sparta. He is also extremely ambitious, and he oversees the transformation, if I read you correctly, Professor, from uh, the, the Athenian alliance to the Athenian empire. <laughs> Right. Uh, Cimon's theme, just or rather a Pericles theme, just like Cimon had a theme, is self-control. 
Uh, it strikes us as an odd thing to emphasize, but this is a guy who never shows any emotion, and this is enormously admired uh, in ancient Greece, as it, it was in samurai Japan and of various other historical points. Um, so you would, if you see him on the street, he walks very slowly, and he never shows any sign of, uh, of, of sadness or anything of, of, of that type, and is much admired for it. Also a member of an important Athenian family, and exactly as you say, uh, he is very anti-Spartan. Uh, his uh, refusal to compromise with Sparta ultimately probably leads to the war, uh, and uh, he is extremely eager that Athens should um, uh, dominate its allies and uh, make as much money as it possibly can from dominating the allies that join Athens to protect them against the Persians originally, but ev eventually just basically become Athens subjects. So Pericles and Cimon, at the time that they overlap, are seen as rival politicians, not just generals, in Athens. Athens, and they both would have had parties attached to them. Cimon dies against the Persians, and uh, Pericles is now in a position to lead the anti-Spartan anti forces when it becomes necessary. But I read him also as an opportunist. He doesn't necessarily want to commit himself to one thing or another as long as he's in charge. Do I read him correctly? You read him correctly, but, I mean, the Greek politi ancient Greek politicians all of them are much more as it are, flexible in their views than we take for granted because there's no party discipline. Uh, but yes, he is without question an opportunist. Uh, he wants to be in charge uh, because, of course, guess what? I don't want to be boring about this. It brings him teammates yes, to be yes, in charge. Yes, yes, it does. Now, now let's talk about the thing that the Athenians do, they pay for, that we can see today. When you look above Athens, if you go there, I uh, urge you to travel to the Parthenon I'm uh, young enough or old enough so that I was able to actually walk the Parthenon that's no longer permitted because of pollution and damage and, and theft. So you can examine it, and there are many, many festivals that uh, demonstrate it. But the Parthenon itself, itself from my reading of you, Professor, uh, ex uh, was built to show Time of this rising power, Athens, and everyone was offended by it, and the Spartans meant, and the Athenians meant to offend them. Is that a good reading of this? Yes, absolutely. Uh, building huge structures is an extremely nice way for the Athenians to demonstrate their equality, or indeed, uh, in someone like Pericles' view, perhaps even their superiority over the Spartans. Because the Spartans, of course, are a completely agrarian economy who, wh where traditionally there's not even any money allowed. And so you can humiliate the Spartans very easily by building enormous, spectacular structures, because they can't compete with you in that sort of thing. Uh, you don't want to try to fight them in a war, necessarily, or a land war, because they're going to beat you in that. But if you want to demonstrate your equality with them, your superiority to them, building big buildings, uh, big temples, is the way to go. I also learned that there's a commercial opponent. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, one more time, John, I'm going to uh, channel my inner Karl Marx. The Athenians express their ability to raise money by building that Parthenon, and the way they raise it is they squeeze their former allies, who are now their, uh, their client states. Their empire is expressed in that Parthenon. That is exactly right. Um, people at Athens complain that it is outrageous to be employ employing the Allies' money in this fashion, to which, the, uh, to which Pericles says, look, we protect these allies of ours, uh, these subjects of ours against the Persians. Once we have provided that protection, we get to spend the money on whatever we want, and what we want to spend it on is the Parthenon, the largest building um, in mainland Greece. And so the Parthenon, when you look at the Parthenon now, consider that that was meant to overwhelm and insult the Spartans. They got it. They understood this in hubris. And remember what happens when you uh, uh, opine that hubris is in your opponent, your rival. You must go to war. You must be satisfied. And it doesn't happen easily, but we're about to go to war in 431. There have been periods of strife in the 5th century BCE between these two rivals, but this one, the Ten-Year War, is the one is the centerpiece of the new book, Song of Wrath, The Peloponnesian War Begins by J.E. Lendon. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.